I recently released a major update to my brewing spreadsheet. I have a lot of changes and enhancements in it. If you want to see more about it, stick around. Hello everyone and welcome back. So version 3 of my brewing recipe spreadsheet is now out. It's uh, been a while since I made a major update version from version 2 to 3 that is. Version 2 came out back in I think July of 2017. I made some incremental updates since then. This is version 3. Uh, I've made some major major updates to this update worthy of, of increasing the uh, number from 2 to 3 on this uh, rather than a point release right. Lots of changes. I added water chemistry. I've rearranged the uh, recipe sheet. I've done a whole bunch of stuff to this spreadsheet that I want to go over in detail in this video. I've noticed that uh, I've got quite the large audience over the past couple of years uh, from when I first started doing this brewing template spreadsheet and my earlier tutorials. And I thought I'd just do a revamp of the whole thing from top to bottom. So I'm going to go over some of the, uh, right from the start, I'm going to go over some of the highlights. I'm going to go, uh, and not just an overview, I'm going to go into a deep dive as well in each of these sections. Now, don't be discouraged. You might notice that this video is about an hour long. However, I will be putting timestamp links in the video description. And so you can either skip to the section you want to learn more about or watch this whole video in its entirety and then go back and watch just the chapters or sections that you actually want to rewatch. I'm doing what I can here to give everyone what they want, uh, a, a deep dive as well as just an overview for those who already know the spreadsheet. I'm trying to satisfy all audiences with a single video. So with all that said, let's get on with the tutorial. Before you can use my spreadsheet, you have to get a copy of it, right? Well, the easiest and most direct way to do this is to go to my website here at beerandbarbecuebylarry.com. And once you go there, scroll over to the tools and calculators tab click on that and it will load the tools and calculators section where if you scroll down you'll see that there is a playlist shown of my uh, tutorials I've done in the past of updates and how to use this thing but right below it is a hyperlink for the latest released version which is currently version 3 in this video and so if you always want the latest greatest version you can always go here and get it you might find older versions of this in some of my brewing recipe videos on YouTube uh, where I use it and put links down in the video description. You're free to use those too, of course, but they may be older than the latest and greatest. So once you download that, you can go back to your spreadsheet here and open it up. And in there, you'll see at the very top um, is a little list of how to use this template. It's hopefully self-explanatory. There, there's a link at the top to the to the playlist I just mentioned on YouTube showing some of the past tutorials including where this one will be when I finish recording it as well as some requirements here I've got a lot of confusion and questions about what version of what program will open it and they and they you know some function is not working for them for example well you need at the very least office Excel to design your recipes because of, of, of a lot of enhancements I've been made I've made due to use requests to support more functionality like pull down lists, look up tables, things like that, uh, which are more advanced functionality than not all spreadsheet tools uh, know how to recognize. So, in order to design a recipe, you really need Excel. The very least 2010, uh, I've, I've quit testing on that because I've upgraded to 2016 now, but supposedly 2010 and higher should work. Now, for viewing recipes or brew day sheets, you you do not need Excel um, for that. I've, I've, I personally actually use my iPad or my iPhone and I use either Google Sheets or the iOS numbers tool, um, which, which is listed here. And that works well for, for viewing and making minor brew day adjustments on the recipe sheet and entering in bit values. But it's not functional for picking hops and grains and things from, the, from those other tabs to, to brew with because that kind of functionality doesn't work uh, either at all or very well. With those other tools so uh, just to let you know to design excel to view any basic spreadsheet program should work and then you go through and you go through the tabs which i'll walk through here and you can print out a copy and or copy it to your home network save it you know put it on your cloud your home network wherever 
so you can access it from your phone or other devices in your house. And uh, that's how I use it, right? And if you find that you find it uh, useful to you and you really like this spreadsheet, consider a little donation for me here. I got a PayPal link here. My time is, uh, you know, precious to me. And I do a lot of uh, updates, many of which are, are user requests, uh, some of which I don't even use ever. So uh, I'm doing a lot of this for you folks um, because I, because I, you know, I'm a nice guy, right? Anyway, uh, so if you, if you feel so inclined and you find my spreadsheet useful, just consider sending me a few bucks for my time. Thanks. All right. Now down a little lower here, there's a version history. I didn't track any changes prior to, to version two. Starting in version two, I started adding some changes in here, as you, as you can see, as I scroll down. And this current version three here, uh, I've made a lot of major updates here, folks. You can read for yourself here or download it and re read it later. But I uh, I did a lot of a, a lot of enhancements. I redesigned the uh, spreadsheet tab. I added a lot of new fields, changed some behaviors, accounted for more additional losses. I added some water chemistry in here. Finally, that that was a big request. Uh, I've also added uh, some more clarification for those who don't want the batch barge but want to fly, brew in a bag, or use extracts. My my spreadsheet could have done all those before if you knew what you're looking at, but I just made it simpler for the novice user to understand what they're looking at on the, on the sheet by having an option to select which method that you use. And I've done some other things in here as well. You, you, I'll, I'll walk through them in more detail. Going on to the recipe tab, I have a, I've, re, I've rearranged this. So if you're new with this, you don't even know that I changed anything, but if you're a user of my previous versions, you, you notice I had a certain layout to it. Well, I actually have now uh, tried to do it a little bit more logically and to put it on one sheet if you print this out. So I pushed all the ingredients towards the left side of the sheet and all the brewing parameters on the right side. And I moved things around a bit. I, I added a whole new section on, on water chemistry here. So this, this whole section right in the middle is, is, is for the water. That's brand new in this version, right? I've consolidated and, and put all the recipe outputs in one section, including a new one for brew house efficiency, which was not there in the past. I did a recent video or you know, I did a recent video and some other past videos about this topic where the extract efficiency is not the same thing as the brew house efficiency. And a lot of brewing different, uh, a lot of different brewing softwares, uh, they either muddle over this or, or, or don't uh, clarify it for the uh, new user that they are different. So I went ahead and put them both on here. Uh, the brew house efficiency is for reference only. It's not actually used anywhere in my spreadsheet other than as a output of your other variables. What's actually primarily used in this recipe is the extract efficiency, like it always has before. And that is a better variable to use for adapting and scaling recipes that you get from other sources. Uh, whereas the brew house efficiency is really only practical for yourself if you're brewing on the same system and on similar recipes over and over again. But uh, we got the, the uh, grain bill on the left, hops bill on the left, and all this information comes from tabs, which I'll go over in just a little bit here. Uh, so these are auto-populated fields. You, you don't enter anything here yet. Anything in yellow is a manual field. So these, so here and all the way down here, you enter in values here. Anything that's in a, like a pale blue or, or, or gray is an auto-calculated field. You do not touch those. Those will fill in as you enter information in the yellow boxes. And on the right side, I rearranged a few things here. As you, as you can see, uh, I try to do it logically and um, chronologically as best I can. So the process parameters, you uh, enter your value or you estimate your values, which I'll go over in the brew house tab for what you expect and the outputs of how much water, total water you need, that you need, how much strike water, how much sparge water, your pre-boil volume estimates. It also estimates your your gravities along the way, your efficiencies, uh, and so on and so forth. You also, I, what I added here was a nice little pull down for uh, the refractometer or hydrometer. So uh, if, if you are a hydrometer user, you pick hydrometer, it'll use fields for, for the hydrometers as you enter them in. If, you're, if, you're, if you want to use the, the outputs from your refractometer, you can switch to refractometer and it will use the values that you enter in for the refractometers. And I'll walk through a little bit of an example of that here. So let's say that um, I punch in my ambient grain temperature here of 68 degrees, right? That's fine. I happen to estimate that my ambient grain temperature measured at 68. 
oh, it did. That's great. Everything looks wonderful. But what if it isn't, which it usually isn't? What if it's 70 degrees? Punching 70 degrees, and it overrides the strike water temperature and highlights it to let you know that it's been overridden. Um, this was a nice enhancement in version 3. In the past, I would actually have to go back down to my computer, punch in the new values for the expected, and get the new value here, and then come back out to my garage and, and uh, continue working, which was just a pain in the butt. So now this automatically does. So now I can open this on my iPhone or on my iPad, enter in right value, get the new updated strike temperature, and carry on and never have to leave my uh, my brew kettle un unattended, for example. So it doesn't uh, do things like boil over, right? Or or get too hot. And you can also, um, so as you go down through the spreadsheet, you you enter in the actual values. So uh, my desired mash temperature is supposed to be 150. I punch in what I measured, it might be 152. Right, uh, strike water volumes. Okay, well, I didn't quite get to 20.6. I don't measure that that fine, so I I, I put a 20, um, 21, let's say, and my strike measurement I put in one in measured in at 161. Uh, my estimated mash pH that's new in version three. Uh, estimating the mash pH that's part of the easy water calculator, which I'll go over in a little bit. It actually copies the value from that tab and puts it in here for you. So if I come in here and say I want to do, uh, I, I can measure it with a pH strip or a, or a meter. Let's just say it's 5.6. All right, uh, sparge water required uh, tells you what to use exactly in order to get your, your, your numbers. But let's say I, I measure it a bit short. And then uh, for me, the, the default value is for batch sparging here. So what you see here are multiple add addition and draining steps for, uh, for your sparge water. So if your mash tun's uh, <clears throat> too small for a single step or the recipe calls for two steps, it'll tell you to add add so much, drain so much, add so much, and drain so much. And there's enough for three steps here. But this section will, will update, which I'll show you in a little bit. You can, uh, it'll change from batch sparge to fly sparge to brew in the bag to extract based upon your options selected in the brew house tab, which I'll also go over soon. So I, I could punch in those measurements if I wanted to here. Right, and then my post volume, uh, my post, my pre-boil volume, I would punch in what I measure there, and I just use a measuring stick with tick marks on it usually to uh, to make those measurements in my cuddle. Uh, that's outside the scope of this of this video, and it's, let's say I want to use my hydrometer as my preferred specific gravity reading tool. Right, so now I make my sp my pre-boil specific gravity. I punch in uh, what I actually measured. It actually might be 105.6. Right. Well, uh, I also have added a area here for the hydrometer temperature sample. So now in version three, uh, if your temperature is calibrated for 60 degrees and it's, you know, let's say you just can't wait till you can chill it down to 60 degrees and it's 68 degrees or 70 degrees, you can punch that actual measured uh, temperature there and it'll give you the corrected value. Right. So I measured one, one, 1.056, but the Sample was 70 degrees, and my hydrometer is calibrated for 60 degrees. It corrects it for me, so I don't have to go look for those, those little um, correction sheets and, and charts in, in order to do all that. It just, do, it just does it for you here. And let's say that you also took a, hydro, a hydrometer reading. You can punch in the uh, Brooks value, which I actually have to guess at what this might be. 14, that's a pretty good guess. 14 bricks converts to 1.057. So I can actually then... If I got both values entered, I can actually say, well, I want to use the refractometer readings. I changed my mind, right? And it'll, it'll come back up here to the recipe outputs and give you all new numbers based upon those values. I want to stick with the hydrometer for the time being. And it'll tell you what your what your actual extract efficiency is down here uh, based upon your hydrometer selection versus your refractometer selection. You enter how long you actually boiled for. Uh, what your post boil measurement was i'll put in 25 quarts for example and my measured original gravity might have been a little high maybe let's just say a little high 1067 whoopsie right and it didn't give me a corrected value because i didn't punch in my measured value and I, I might have said okay it was 67 degrees and it gave me a corrected value there and i keep doing this 
like that, right? And then uh, how much of it went into the fermenter? I think that's a new field here in version three. I don't think I actually had that displayed necessarily. I mean, they've measured it in the brew house setups tab. But I never didn't have it displayed here on the recipe sheet. So I punched that in there. And of course the final gravity, a couple weeks later, you say, okay, well, I measured in at 1.014 at, uh, at 58 degrees, right? And uh, that's what you get, right? So, and then of course, target size, let's say, I, not my target size okay and this is for completeness he punched the me punching this oh that was too low now let's do 7.5 that's close enough oh look at that perfect and that's the basic so i have this thing all filled out and you may have not have noticed this but up here in the recipe outputs all these values in the actual columns start to populate and fill in from what you measured over here and so the extract efficiency was designed at this value, which I'll go over in a, in a minute here, and the actual value. So the same thing. So the design parameters come from a combination of what you enter in, uh, in, in, in all the tabs, basically, that I'm about to go over. But primarily, it's affected in the brew house tab, the grain tab, so on and so forth. And I'll go over those in more detail. All right. So that's an overview of the, re the recipe sheet. Uh, also, some yellow areas for adding extra ingredients, such as yeast starters, world flock tablets, uh, orange peel, coriander, spices, things like that. And in a notes section that you can uh, edit and uh, add information to. And this is what you print out on brew day or display on your um, tablet or your laptop on brew day. We're now going to go over the brew house setup and calcs tab. If you didn't notice before, the spreadsheet has a whole lot of tabs in it, right? We just went over the instructions tab and the recipe sheet tab. Now we're in the brew house setup and calcs tab. And here's where you set up your brew house parameters for your brew system. Start at the top, you gotta choose a, un a unit of measure. Now I am a US citizen, so I use US customary units, but I also back in version two added support for metric units. So if you're a metric user, you, you select metric and it changes the unit values here from the US customary like this to metric. And it does it not just here, but uh, everywhere else. So the recipe sheet now, for example, will show you uh, liters and um, Celsius, for example. So just keep that in mind. It, but what it does not do by toggling this is automatically convert your input values. This is just a spreadsheet, folks. Uh, these are just input fields. They stay as they were entered. So if you are going back and forth between metric and U.S. customer units, you need to actually do your own conversions for quarts to liters, for example, or liters to quarts, and Fahrenheit, Celsius, and back. But you shouldn't be doing back and forth, right? So really, once you set up your units and set your default values, you can actually save this spreadsheet as a template for you to use going forward for new recipes and not have to do this every time. And what this does is also um, changes how things are calculated. So if you scroll down, for example, there's a calculations field section here, which, which spits out values in your units. These uh, formulas in here actually do account for metric versus U.S. customary. So those do scale and change. Everything in blue will scale and change based upon which unit system that you use. It's just that your inputs aren't affected. So again, you may get to manually change those yourself. I'm going to go with the U.S. custom units because that's what I use every day, or every time I brew at least. And uh, also here, another link to the playlist here where this video will also be stored. All right, so if you scroll down here a little bit, uh, I tried to break this up into process equipment sections, right? So, so for process, you, you can see here there's a lot of input values here uh, for all these different variables, the input values, the units and a description of what they are. I also added a section far to the right for, for your own personal notes that you can come in here and add things that you want to remember in the future. For example, I noticed that the, the, like the grain absorption ratio or rate changes based upon the malts. And I discovered that myself at, at some point in the past. So I put a little note in here to that effect. Uh, or some dead space values for the grain father versus my Sprite kettle because I have two different brew systems. All right, and so those are your own notes section. You can fill those in with wh whatever you want uh, for the future for for reference, right? All right, so going back to the process parameters tab, I have my target batch size. Now, this spreadsheet is premised on 
batch size being the amount of final beer in your packaged volume, which is bottles or kegs or whatever that you want to do. A lot of recipes, especially a lot of older ones I've seen out there that you get as, especially as a newbie, they are, they, they call them five gallon batches, but truth is they're, they're more like four gallon batches when you're all said and done, which is kind of discouraging, right? Uh, so I scale my recipes with the spreadsheet to give me five gallons into the keg or, or bottles. And uh, so that may differ. That may be a slightly different philosophy from other brewing software tools that you use. Just keep in mind, it's an ambiguous term, batch size, right? So that's how I define it. In fact, I even say so here in the final uh, amount of finished beer going into the kettle or bottles after fermentation is complete. That's the description there. So that's that's how I clarify it. Your ambient grain temperature is important to know uh to get to your desired mash temperature because your ambient grain temperature is used with the formula to calculate what straight water temperature you need which is shown later down in the spreadsheet to get you to your desired mash temperature right so so i plug in what i think is the most common value uh for my grain i put 68 degrees fahrenheit whatever it is for you it is for you your desired mash temperature now this isn't going to be the same for every single recipe uh, so maybe this doesn't really necessarily belong here but it is here for now. And if you highlight over it, uh, I have a little pop-up that says uh, the typical range for mashing. So if you're new to new with this, it gives you kind of, kind of an idea. Higher temperatures promote a fuller body beer. Lower temperatures promote a lighter, thinner body beer. And this is really uh, an area where you can affect the, the taste of your beer. Now, one thing I also did this version three is I added a lot of pop-ups like, like this. So if I pick on different um, fields, these pop-ups come up now with a little bit more of an explanation. And I think that should be helpful for not just myself as a, as a reminder of certain details like you might see in this pop-up here, uh, but for newbies too who don't know what to enter in. Uh, I put some values maybe over in the description, but uh, sometimes it's nice just, just to see it on the input field. So that's something I did in version three. Uh, the water to grist ratio is something that you want to, you know, how much water do you want to add for the grain for your mash? You know, there's there's different ratios and ranges that different people use for different purposes. And there's also the grain absorption ratio, which is how much water the grain absorbs. And that is um, dependent upon the type of grain as well as I discovered over over the years. But I have some uh, some information here, some, some suggested values. Your extract efficiency. Now, this is your mash extract efficiency which is typically between 65 to 80 percent for batch barging and a little higher for for, uh, for fly sparging. now this is a value enter in that you've measured and averaged over some past number of brews so it's somewhat accurate based upon your brewing history now if you're brand new at this you don't know what to put in i would suggest put in 75. and if it comes out differently and your beer's a little different that's okay now you have a beta point to go back to and enter in here for your next brew and that's the uh, strength of having this as a input field is that you can actually zero in on a recipe that you were guessing at originally and you tailor it and maybe the next time you brew it you'll be dead on with your gravity numbers All right that's an important field the boil time is the length of boil self-explanatory evaporation rate i changed this in version three this used to be a percentage of the volume which is what i stole or borrowed from other brewing software in the past. Uh, and I, I, I never liked that because it, the, a percentage of, of a ever changing or decreasing volume implies that the evaporation rate will change over that time, which is nonsense. I mean, if you have a set kettle geometry and it's set heat and it's boiling at a certain rate, it should evaporate just as much water when it's this full as it would when it's this full. And uh, so I so I change it to a flat uh, boil off rate of uh, quarts per hour or liters per hour, and uh, so you can measure that by boiling your water for a half hour, let's say, uh, or a whole hour if you want, and measure the change in volume, and you can calculate this evaporation rate very easily. And, that, and that's what I've done here for the grandfather. It looks like it says grandfather two quarts per hour. My spike 20 gallon kettle. I've actually apparently have not measured that yet, so that will be a, a feature thing I measure and and put. Uh, a note in here on my note section off to, off to the far right. The water boil temperature, that's going to vary upon your elevation or altitude, whatever. So where I live, I'm about 700 feet above sea level here, here around Chicagoland. It's, so water boils at 210.6. Uh, 
that affects some some equations in here. Now here's something new I also did for version three: the hop absorption rate. The hop absorption rate um, is uh, similar to the gradient absorption rate. It tries to account for losses of of your beer or wort or water uh, due to absorption into the material. So I did the gradient absorption rate, which which is a loss basically of how much water you added. It'll be you you'll get less beer out because the grain absorbed a certain amount of water. The same is true for the hops. The hops will also absorb some water. Now, if you only have an ounce or two of hops, you're not even probably going to even notice it, but some of these supercharged beers like the any IPAs now that I've been brewing or double IPAs, things that use a lot of hops, you have opportunity to lose a lot of beer. So I try to account for that here by putting a value that you can enter. Whatever you think it is, I just use 0.1. That's something I've uh, kind of estimated and read on forums that people use as well. Um, it, it may be different. I may update it myself. You may update it. It's really up to you to decide what that quantity is. I've also now in the in the equipment parameters section. Now, one of the enhancements I made here, which I'll go over as I go through this, uh, I'll, I'll show you in the context here. Uh, the size of your mash tun and boil kettle, if you're not careful, could overflow uh, because you didn't estimate the displacement of the water with the grain that you put in there, which is why people who do brew in the bag brewing need a much larger kettle, because you're putting the full amount of grains and the full amount of water in the kettle, it requires more volume. Uh, so if you if you think of it that way now, right? So this this spreadsheet's defaulted to 32 quarts, which is the size of my grandfather. You can see my pop-up here, my pop-up here says for my 70 quart Coleman, I get 65. Now I measured these in the past and I have a little notes off off to the side here um, that 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 state that right so I don't forget but what if I uh, only had a 24 quart um, mash ton for this grain bill it turns red now now that's a new piece of functionality the red means it's going to overflow in old in previous versions of my software these capacity checks boxes up here would, would toggle pass fail uh, now that was okay if, if you're Kind of scrolled to where you are here but if you saw just a minute ago i was off screen with it and if i punch in 24 i wouldn't have noticed that uh, i was overflowing because i didn't scroll up so that that was a potential cause of error uh, i've never been burned by it but I, I wonder if other people have so now if you undersize your mash ton um 28 works i think it was 32 it goes back to normal and it says pass again and it, and it does the same thing for the boil kettle so it's an enhancement in version three. For the uh, max fill, that's a percentage, so you don't fill all the way to the top. So the capacity is 32, but that means right to the very rim, right? So if, if, if you want a margin of safety, especially for your boil kettle, you would set it to some value less, like 90%, like I show you here. Uh, something that's also new in version three is the, bat, is the uh, sparge method. When I designed this recipe uh, spreadsheet, it was basically for just single infusion bash sparge brewing because that's basically what I do almost all the time. But, uh, and that could have been used, the resulting output could have been used as well for uh, the recipe sheet for for, for splice for, uh, splice sparging because you already had the sparge water listed in there uh, and you could just ignore the uh, sparge steps that were listed for the bash sparge because you weren't doing that. But, that, but this confused some people who weren't doing mass barging. So I clarified it here in the brew house setup tab, where now you can pick a, a, an option here. You have batch, fly, brew in a bag, or extract. So if I choose from batch to fly, a new field pops up for the fly sparge flow rate that you want to use. So I put one quart per minute as a default. That's, that's the default, you can change that. Then you go back to the recipe sheet, and now you see the batch sparge turned from batch sparge to fly sparge. These got zeroed out. You can actually blank these out even. Uh, so it'll estimate a time required at that flow rate and for posterity you can record that uh, actual time so let's say it took 20 minutes and your actual flow rate was actually then measured to be only 0.75 quarts per per uh, minute so uh, th so there's better support for for fly sparging on here the same thing for brew in the bag you can pick on brew in the bag um, this no longer is valid again you go back to the recipe spreadsheet, it blanks everything out because you're not doing any of that. You're just taking the whole sparge water amount and dumping it into your kettle with the grains. So it just blanks them all out, gets rid of any confusion for you, as well as, uh, let's see, now you do the extract version, extract version, 
Uh, same thing. It's just because you're not doing sparge. You're just pouring uh, malt powder or syrup into the kettle. So it's not necessary at all. But for those who wanted to actually see that on there, there you go. You didn't, you didn't need this functionality before. If you know what you're doing and what you're looking at, you could have just used the batch sparge and just ignored this. But whatever. It's there for you now. And it should help some of you at least, right? And what else we got here? And some dead spaces. Now, these are the dead spaces. These are losses that you're going to experience um, in your equipment. So you can measure these. So, for example, your water ton dead space is basically the dead space in your matter, uh, mash slash water ton uh, down under your manifold. It's the amount of liquid left over after you drain the mash ton. So that's amounts to a loss in the final amount of beer, right? And you can measure this. I, I measure... All these losses with either plain water, if I'm in a hurry, or if I want a real precise value, I'll put a small amount of crushed grains and soak them like a small batch of beer, basically, uh, near the bottom of this vessel and drain the water out and pour the remaining water out and measure the volume of the water. And that's what my actual loss is. Uh, so if you're in a hurry, you just use plain water, which will be more of a maximum loss. You can do the mix it, mix it with the grains to get a more precise loss. The same thing for the boiler kettle, although, although that you don't use grains, you can actually uh, measure that as well. So you open your spigot in the bottom or you use your auto siphon to siphon out of your brew pot. Whatever volume of liquid in the bottom, you pour it out into a measuring uh, jar or whatever and you can measure out that volume. Something I added here for hydrometers again uh, is the hydrometer calibration temperature and correction factors. I talked a bit about this in a recent video about hydrometer testing and calibration. Uh, so, right, so I added this enhancement in version 3 as a result of that video. And what you do is enter in the calibration temperature of your hydrometer. And if you calibrated your hydrometer at, in distilled water and it didn't read 1.0 and it reads some, and it read something else like 0.998, you would add an adjustment uh, back to your 0 0.002, for example, right? And what, and what that does is that if you go back to your recipe sheet, uh, it'll actually offset your values. Um, let's see, this one here, um, C, so 1.059. This was 1.057 before, I think. If I go back and blank this out, back to zero, just to double check. Yeah, 1.057. So you don't have to always apply the correction here. If you have a hydrometer that, that you use regular that's always offset, you just punch that offset value in here, and um, it'll account for that. So when you go back and measure the hydrometer, you record the actual reading on the hydrometer, put it in here, and it will adjust it for you. And that's useful in case you're brewing with a buddy or something who doesn't know that your hydrometer is offset and they're recording results. You don't have to worry about them uh, remembering or have to tell them to add or subtract a certain amount. They just tell them, just read the hydrometer, write it down, and move on. Work correction factor, that's for the hydrometers. This is the correction factor. I haven't done a video on refractometers yet. I probably probably should or, or, or will someday, but you also need to calibrate your refractometers if you didn't know that, and uh, and you get a, a value from, from doing the math and uh, a series of measurements, and you come up with a correction factor for, your beef, for, for the beer style that you're using, and that's used to adjust the actual bricks value that, that, that you measure. So I punch in 14 bricks, let's say, in this one value, it converts it to 1057 specific gravity using that correction factor back back over here okay so that's an important factor to uh, keep an eye on too and scrolling down uh, calculations just again uh, it just shows you how much volume your dry grain will use how much water you need the strike volume and temperature uh, your losses along the way the, the, the number of batch sparge steps if you're, if you're doing batch sparging um, and also your pre-boil your losses through evaporation your hop losses and, and all of this gets incorporated ultimately and in, in mapped to your spreadsheet, right? So it will tell you what your estimated uh, gravities and, and expected volumes will be. And these design outputs are based upon all this stuff in here. So that's the brew house setup tab. This here is the grain and sugar calcs tab. Now we're getting into recipe design, right? So here's where you punching your grain bills and adjuncts and uh, sugars. So what I have here is, well, on the left side are the yellow input entries, right? You, you can pick on 
a row and you'll get a pull down list of all the uh, grains and sugars that I have in a, a tab further down the line here, which I can show you too. But listen, so I can scroll down here and pick some sugars, roasted malts, sugar, uh, so sugars, Vienna malts, wheat malts, so, so on and so forth, and punch in the amount I want to use. Now this says pounds, but right? But remember, if I went back and picked on metric, it'll it'll change things to kilograms. Okay, so again, every one of these tabs supports metric too. Let me go back and grab my U.S. customary. Go back to the grain tab and punching your values. And what happens here, it'll, it'll calculate the percent of the grain bill because, and, and, and that's kind of important because the percent of the grain bills are, are a way to convey recipes to other people uh, that may want to scale them up or scale them down. So, you'll, you know, you might do a five gallon batch or a five and a half gallon batch, but the person that you give this to might want to do a 20 gallon batch. And they can scale it up here too as well. But a lot of times people like to see percentages. And it also gives you a good rule of thumb you know how they say that you shouldn't use certain type of malts and greater than a certain percentage of the grain bill that helps with that here too right so caramel malt shouldn't be used in i don't know if it's more than 10 percent of the grain bill i think it shows it at 3.6 and what it does here is it goes through um, all these calcs and it, and, it, and it picks up the maximum points uh, per gallon which is a way to calculate the uh, sugar yield from these and all this information comes from a tab called the grain and sugar list which is a separate tab further down the row and, and what you have here is a list of uh, of all the grains i have stored in here there are extract uh, moisture contents their maximum ppgs their uh, color rating and the source where i got it from and you can edit this val uh, this 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 table real easily by going to review and unprotect sheet right and then you can actually insert rows uh, insert row right and you, and you can enter in, in your own information here and you're good to go I would just suggest you go back and reprotect the sheet again because it's easy to uh, accidentally blow something away right so what you would do is that you would punch in your new value your new grain is it a sugar or a grain I've done this before here yeah, anyway uh, the uh, extract uh, that you get from the malt sheet, which is available from these sources, so you have to go to the malters' websites, find their their data sheets, and punch in this information. And there's a calculation here, uh, which I don't have displayed on my spreadsheet at the moment. But there's a formula that you that will calculate the maximum PPG on here for you. And all this information gets entered back into the grain and sugar calcs tabs. And what it then does. It estimates your pre-boil points, your post-boil points, your actual color, the malt color units, and comes up with uh, not just the total combined amount of grains, uh, the points involved, the pre- and post-boil specific gravities, uh, the contributions from the mash, uh, grains, or the sugars, and the total. So it's telling you that the pre-boil specific gravity is 1.05. Seven, the post boil should be 1.065, and the actual color of your beer will be 6.1 SRM. And these values get mapped to the recipe sheet up here, as you can see, right? And there they are. So you can print this out when you when you go shopping. You'll have your uh, the grains there, and also your hops, which, which I'll go over next. Under the hops bill. So what I have here is uh, where you have calculate your hops okay so again the yellow are input fields you can come in here and pick from a pull down of hops just like the grain bill pick, pick your hops off a grain list or a hops list that comes from a hops list tab here yeah so again you can actually unprotect the sheet add uh, add a row add your your hops that's not on here and reprotect the sheet and come back to hops calcs and select it from the pull down list yeah, you enter in your, the alpha percentages that are there for the hops that you bought and the quantity. And this says ounces, but it'll switch to grams, again, if you're using metric units. The type of hops, pellets, leaf, or plugs. I have, I've never seen plugs in all these years I've been home brewing, but once upon a time, I guess they, they uh, used to be a thing. So pellet, the, the time that uh, you want to boil them. And there's some presets in here for first word hopping. Uh, 60 minutes all the way down to zero minutes hop stands and dry hops now for dry hops uh, well actually for more than just dry hops for the hop stands too this whole uh, hop bill calculator is 
basically is, is based on boil times, right? So you'll get the best total IBU estimate here based upon the assumption that these are all in boil hops. Now we know that dry hops and hop stands and things contribute bitterness. Those aren't so well accounted for in this because this is sort of a, an older way of doing uh, IBU calcs. I have not yet found anywhere um, a more modern method to account for bitterness contributions from dry hops and or hop stands. But in version three, I did add a, a hop stand adjustment factor in here to kind of, it's basically a fudge factor that you, that you can use to to bump up the estimated IBUs. And this is still a work in progress. Uh, it doesn't account for temperature uh, for the hop stand, for example. It's just a fudge factor, much in the way that, that these other ones here are fudge factors. And I've gotten questions upon these two. Uh, these are fudge factors based upon um, the effect of the different form of hops, right? So all these IBU calcs are based primarily on whole leaf hops, but um, those are harder, harder and harder to come by. It seems nowadays pellet hops are, are much more uh, common at, at my homebrew shop, for example. And because of the compactness and and, the, and less matter, I guess, that's in the pellets versus the whole hops, the pellets can be a little bit more bitter. They add a little bit more bitterness than the whole leaf hops will. So I made a distinction here by, by giving you a fudge factor as well to punch in um, that hot pellets are a little bit more bitter than whole leaf hops. So like in this case, I have it at 10% more. If you think it should be zero or 15 or five, whatever, you can override that. And the same thing for plugs and first word hopping is also one of those things that's sort of ambiguous. Uh, how much more bitterness does first word hopping contribute uh, than just boil hops? Well, I put a 10% fudge factor of, of increased bitterness for first word hopping. Um, these are again all fudge factors that, that you control because they're yellow fields, they're, they're, they're uh, actually inputs. But what, what, what you'll get here is a summary of total estimated bitterness, the total amount of hops. And uh, let's say I wanted to change my dry hop or my 30 minute hops to a hop stand. Here's something also added that's new in version three, but, uh, the hop stand selection. So I pick on hop stand. Now you notice something popped up here, time, right? How long are they going to stand? So now you can actually punch in an actual time and it estimates a bitterness contribution. So if it was zero, there'd be no contribution. It'll, it'll be, as, it'll be as, as, as if there wasn't any, right? But if you pick on hop stand anywhere in here, it'll, it'll start adding um, fields for you to put a time. Now, there's no support for uh, temperature yet because this is my first iteration at this, but it's better than what I had in version two. And until I understand and can find better information about how hop stands work, that's actual, that could be converted to some sort of formula <laughs> in order to estimate them. This is going to have to be what it is for the time being. But it's a, it's a step forward and then, then, then the past. So I'll stay with it. And uh, we'll see how this goes for version three, right? I might change it for version four or, uh, or update it for version three in the future. And then all these values get mapped to the recipe sheet as well, right? So uh, the species, the pellets, again, alpha, and I put AAUs in here. Now, these are alpha acid units. These are not so much meant for brewing, but they're meant to convey quantity, right? So if you go to the homebrew shop and you can't find 10.8% alpha hops, but, but you find 10, um, it'll tell you how much total you need. So it's basically... The alpha, the alpha percentage times the quantity comes up with the alpha units. So you, you can do the math at the homebrew shop in your head even to, to estimate, well, they've only got 10.5. I'm going to need X amount of alpha acid units, AAUs. And so you buy a little bit more hops to account for that. Uh, so, uh, But it also lists the time, the dry hops, and now the hop stand and the time of the, of the hop stand in there as well for like the brew day. And that's the hop calcs tab. Moving on to the water chemistry. Uh, for this version three, uh, because I had a lot of requests uh, asking me why I don't ac um, account for water chemistry well. Truth is, I've been kind of spoiled uh, with Lake Michigan water here. It's basically decent enough water for, for brewing that I never felt I needed to enhance it over the years. So I never really met, got into water chemistry. But now with version three and from a lot of you asking for this, I actually went out and found and, and looked over a bunch of various water chemistry spreadsheets that are available out there. And the one I settled on here is the Easy Water by this fellow. Let me scroll down here. 
uh, Bella Kai, who wrote this. So th this is not my work. This is his work, and he also has a PayPal link in in his spreadsheet that I also have in, in this tab because I just took his tab, his spreadsheet, and, and embedded it as a tab in my spreadsheet. So if you take advantage of this functionality, please don't be a, a freeloader and and consider giving this guy some cash for hit for 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 his effort in providing this for us all right but there's two tabs though um unfortunately the only, the only downside to the easy water is that they have it in two different tabs a metric tab and a u.s customary units tab uh, it's not a combined tab and i'm not going to go break into his uh, tab and try to make it universal i just don't have the patience and time and energy right now to do that so i left it as is with some modifications so I did link some fields into his spreadsheet so if you if you used easy water before if or if not there's there's two tutorials out there for it and I'm just starting to learn it myself actually but uh, the starting the starting water profile is the first thing you enter in these are actually mapped from your inputs that you would put in the recipe spreadsheet so these original inputs here for your for your water source you would you would enter these in here and these values get mapped to both the English and metric versions of this tab here, right? And your mash water and sparge water are also mapped from what you put in here for your brew house setup tab in your, in your equipment profile, basically. And so those are all automatically entered, as well as the amount of grains are automatically entered. So you don't have to go here and retype everything in here again. I tried to remove some of that extra work. Uh, what I couldn't map over though was uh, the selection of the grain type. So unfortunately, you're going to have to know that pale two-row malt is a base two-row malt. Um, what else did I have here on my on my uh, grain tab? I had pale ale malt. That's another base two-row malt, right? So I come back here and make sure I have base two-row malt. I have crystal malt. I, I just checked that right, and they'll ask you the uh, color rating, which in this case was 40. Lova bond. So I go back in here and punch in 40, and it gives me some estimates for pH, and it comes down here and tells me what, what my pH is or should be, which that field then is mapped to the estimated mash pH here, right? So there's some back and forth with this. It probably could be improved in the future, but for my first iteration, this is what I have. Now, what's what's great about this though is that you come down here and it kind of gives you some explanations here which is really nice so you say okay well um here's my resulting water profile uh, there's some recommended ranges that were in the spreadsheet so if you want to bump up something let's say calcium you can come up here and say well i want to add some calcium well i can do that here or here based upon whether or not you want to raise or lower your ph so step 4a is is this is, is if you want to lower the ph so this thing is suggesting 5.4 to 5.6 pH. This is actually higher. So I would say, well, I, I want to adjust mash down. So I would come in here and punch in a value of, say, it's 3 grams of calcium, uh, well, gypsum. And it actually added some more that I need to add for the sparge water. I come down here, and it bumps it up to above what it was before. I think it was 37. And it did lower it a bit, but maybe not as much. So you, you can come up here and punch in values and see how it affects your water chemistry and decide whether or not you want those changes or not, because this is entirely up to you. You can add other other things in here. Uh, you want to add some calcium chloride, maybe a couple grams of Epsom salt, and it, and it updates everything down here for you. And what and so what, what, what it, now what my spreadsheet does is, is take these re resulting values and maps them back to the recipe sheet as your adjusted water profile, just like it was in the tab here. So this, this whole row here has been transposed to the adjusted water profile and also lists you the quantities of which to put in the mash and the sparge for you. So it's all there on your brew sheet. So that's pretty cool. Uh, I'm looking forward to doing this in the future as well. So uh, I'm actually pretty excited about this. Onto the yeast list. Now, this is the same and similar as what I showed you briefly before about the grain and sugar lists and the hops list. The yeast list is just a list that uh, is pulled from in other areas of the spreadsheet. So in this case for the yeast, if you go to the recipe sheet 
there is a pull down list here for the yeast that you want to use. So as, as you go through and pick various yeast strains, it'll, it'll auto populate the optimal fermentation temperature as well as the uh, as as well as the brand, which is part of picking and it's not a big deal. But this information comes from the yeast tab. And so if there's something in here that you don't see that you need, you can actually come here and, un and unprotect the sheet, insert a row, copy a row, whatever, fill out the, all the information in here, including the most important is the average attenuation and the temperature ranges, because those three fields are used and mapped to the recipe sheet to come up with not just the fermentation range listed here, but the attenuation value is used to estimate your final gravity up here, okay? So uh, that's important to get that right, to have a good estimation of your final gravity. And that's pretty straightforward. There shouldn't be any need to, to, uh, to do much with this other than add or subtract yeasts. If you have a whole category of yeasts that you want added to the default spreadsheet, so you don't have to re-enter them every time I come up with a new spreadsheet version, send me a message, email, whatever, or reach out to me on my website, and I'll try to get them in there for the, for the next update. But when you're done adding stuff, you pick on Protect Sheet again, that just locks all the cells, so you can't accidentally erase a field and then screw up the uh, formulas and the recipe later on elsewhere. And that's it for the yeast list. Also, what's new in version 3 is this hydrometer testing and correction tab. I did a video uh, a while back now about hydrometer testing and, and calibration where I show you how to calibrate your hydrometer at both a reference temperature of one point a reference temperature and uh, zero of 1.0 on your hydrometer and also a in a testing solution of a sugar solution well this is how you can do that uh, to come up with your testing solution you come up with your desired amount of de degrees play-doh which converts to a specific gravity that you want to check your hydrometer at and uh, how much of a solution that you need uh, depending on the size of your, of your hydrometer jar. And it'll tell you exactly how much sucrose or table sugar to use and exactly how much distilled water to use. And that's what I used to, in that video to generate that solution in that video. Also over to the right here a little bit is a little uh, calculator to, tell, to help walk you through the effects of temperature of your measured hydrometer sample. So you punch in your, your hydrometer your hydrometer is actual calibrated temperature. Let's say it's 60 degrees, but you measured a 68 degree sample. It'll actually correct the gravity for you here without having to look for those little cheat sheet charts or whatever that help you auto correct for the temperature difference of your sample. It's just something to explore with here. There's, there's also units for Celsius too. So for you metric users out there, don't feel too bad, <laughs> right? Now this is all uh, basically already embedded this functionality at least in the brew house setup tab and the re recipe tab already right i showed you that earlier with the uh, hydrometer calibration temperature field and offset here and that effect that that it corrects for information here uh, based upon those values but this but this separate tab is a separate standalone tab you can play with it and figure out and try different things on your own without affecting your actual recipe what you look at that here is something else that's new in version three but not new unto itself this is my draft system line balancing spreadsheet calculator that I had done a video on a long time ago to help you figure out how to reduce foam in your beer by adjusting the length of your beer line, right? I did a whole video on that, so go check it out when you, when you can. But I figured I would embed it in here going forward, uh, trying to sort, sort of keep it up with the Joneses. I've, I've noticed more brewing software other than my spreadsheet are doing this, uh, this kind of stuff, these, these little extras. So. Rather than having it as a separate file, I just threw it in uh, just to put it all, all in one place. So now, if you've never seen this before and haven't seen that video, it's, this is basically you, you you input your inputs in here based upon the, the geometry and some uh, variables on your draft system. It'll run some, some actual science in the background, right? It's got some equations and, uh, and assumptions here in case you want to proof check or disprove what, what I've done here, along with some assumptions down below as to uh, of assumptions that were used in these formulations because they're pretty complicated and it'll tell you the length of beer line that you need to use to keep foam out of your beer so for those of you who still think that you have to have a keg pressure and a, and a different surface temperature which is nonsense it just means that your stress system is unbalanced um, you can actually balance it with a spreadsheet by inputting your 
variables here and it'll tell you how long of a beer line you need to offset the pressure in your keg so you don't get tons of foam in your beer. Here's a carbonation tab. This is not necessarily new for version 3. This has been around forever. In fact, so long it predates my versioning numbers of this thing. And I used this a lot back when I was bottling. I haven't bottled in like probably a decade or more. So I can't verify or vouch that these things are actually accurate today. But they worked really well back then. And what happens here is that you punch in. There's a choice of three different priming sugar methods because there are three different approaches uh, or that I found at the time out there. And what you do is that you punch in, in yellow your inputs for your per preferred amount of CO2 into your beer based upon some charts that you can find. And I put a couple of sample charts here off, off, off to the right. Um, so you can take a look at those for, uh, for guidelines as to what to input in here. But it'll take your batch volume from the recipe sheet. So it is linked to the, rest, to the recipe sheet now where it wasn't before. And it'll tell you how much... Uh, pure glucose, corn sugar, dry malt extract, or liquid malt extract you need to carbonate your beer to your desired level. And these are estimates, I think. Uh, they're not always accurate, but they're more accurate than the rule of thumb of using three quarters cup of, of sugar. Um, these actually are weights. Weights are way more accurate than volume measurements when it comes to things like this. So, uh, so these are all measured in weights and are hence more accurate. And down at the very bottom is a keg carbonation estimator for forced carbonation. Now I already have this on my recipe sheet here down below for forced carbonation. So you punch in the amount of volumes of CO2 you want in it, the temperature that you're going to chill it to, and it'll tell you what pressure to set the uh, keg to to get you that carbonation level. And that's been there for a while too. That's not that's nothing new. It's just I wanted to clarify that for those who are who are newer or new to the spreadsheet. Another interesting tab which you may not want to mess with too often, but it's interesting to note in my spreadsheet is there are also two different methods to determine the maximum PPGs in your grain bill. Remember I, uh, back in the grain bill, uh, let's see, grain and sugar calcs, it was calculating the actual maximum P PPG that you can get out of each of these grains, right? Well, there's different methods to do that. If I go back to my grain and sugars list, uh, there's four formulas in each of these cells that will calculate this based upon the information from these cells, right? Now, there's two different methods out there, and I chose, I think I chose, let me double check here. I chose, I wanted to go with method one, which I was told was, was more accurate from what I understand, because it takes into account moisture content. However, uh, after going through all hundred or more of these in, individual grain sheets from these different monsters not all of them gave you a moisture content which made calculating this almost impossible and as well as using this method method one um, gave very very different maximum uh, sugar P uh, ppg values than what's commonly available out there in a lot of these generic grain lists used by other brewing software tools which were given very different results for gravities on the beer and Honestly, if everyone's so used to using these other values, uh, which are more in line with, with method two down here, which is what I ultimately used, I decided to go with method two uh, to avoid a lot of the hassles and questions and problems that result of somebody going, well, I use your spreadsheet and it doesn't match Beersmith or, or Ruben's friend or whatever. Well, um, so so rather than going through that that hassle, I just went ahead and went with method two here, which is which I think was sourced from either John Palmer and Brew Your Own Magazine at some point. And it's got its own formula way of doing it without it. And uh, and using this formula, method two, the actual values in this list for max PPG actually did approximate uh, those more popular, well-known generic values a lot closer. So I just went with method two. But you can come back in here again, unlock the spreadsheet, change the formula to the formula for method one and drag and copy them all the way down and use those values. So that's why that this is still in here. It's, it's just in case either I change my mind or, or, or if you prefer this method, you can implement it. It's really entirely up to you. I just find it interesting, so I left it in here. And the final tab I think that might be of interest to some of you up here is a old all grain to extract and extract to all grain conversion chart. Now, uh, I was an extract brewer for years before going to all grain, probably little, how many of you are as well. And I wanted to know, I was getting uh, all grain recipes a lot, and I wanted to convert them for extract, and 
and I was going from extract. I want to take my extract recipes and convert them to all grain later. So I came up with this chart here. Uh, the color coding is a little different. It's no, it's, it's no longer yellow and blue. It's, it's actually blue and green. I think blue is your input and, and, and green are the, uh, the, the output. So what you want to do, let's say that you want to go, uh, that, that you find an all grain recipe that calls for so many pounds of um, pale malt, uh, malt, right? And you want to know how much dry malt extract or liquid malt, malt extract uh, that comes from that. It'll do that for you. The same thing for wheat malt. It's a little different. Uh, going the opposite way, if you have extract recipes that you want to convert to all grain, because now you're now you're doing all grain, you can punch in how much liquid or dry malt extract that you were using in that extract recipe, and it'll tell you how much to use in terms of of grain. Now I have not used these in so long, I can't vouch for their accuracy anymore, but it did give me a jump start uh, in converting recipes back then, and it was very helpful. I have not done it. In over a decade so again um, just double check your work here or my work and and hopefully it'll, it'll help you to, to uh, some degree i hope you're not bored to death from watching this whole thing uh, it is kind of dry material at times but you have to admit some of the stuff is pretty cool i'm totally stoked about it because i have yet to brew with it in fact i will be, will be brewing with it pretty soon probably by the time you watch this i'll have already brewed on it and i'm looking forward to, to take advantage of some of the uh, some of these new enhancements as well and don't forget, I have these timestamp links that you can go back and rewatch without having to skip around my video trying to find the section you want. Hopefully, they'll help you navigate and go back and rewatch sections that are, that are of interest to you without having to watch the whole video over again. If you have any questions about the spreadsheet, go ahead and write them down below in the comments section. I'm sure uh, a question you have might be uh, want to be asked by many other people. So if you could put your questions down in the comment section down below, I will answer it there and hopefully answer other people's questions as well at the same time without having to answer the same question multiple times. And just a reminder, if you find this spreadsheet useful, please consider sending me some money via my PayPal link in the video description down below or on the link on the spreadsheet. I put lots of hours and time into the spreadsheet uh, just to get all these user enhancements in, some of which I don't even use, but I, I put them in for you folks. So if you could do uh, an in-kind contribution, that, that would be great. And don't forget the, uh, the fellow there who did the easy water tab. Now, he's also asking for some donations. So if you're going to be doing some water chemistry with this, it would be probably proper to throw a few, uh, a few dollars his way as well. If you're a new viewer and not yet subscribed, consider subscribing. I do home brewing and cooking videos, how-tos, and some product reviews. Just pick on the subscribe button and ring the bell so you get notified of uh, new videos that come out. And for all of you out there, thanks for watching. I'll talk to you all later. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out other videos on my YouTube channel and don't forget to subscribe.